All right. Hi, Dr. Gastel. Hello, Alyssa. Uh, you have been chosen by our English students to be the next um, faculty spotlight. So congratulations. Thank you. It's an honor. Um, so I think I will start with some easy questions and then we'll get into the more in-depth questions. Okay. Um, and let's see. So first, how long have you been teaching? Um, I came to WCU in 1998, but I started teaching in my first year of graduate school, which was 1989. So I've been at Western for 22 years, but I've been teaching for 32 or 33 years. Um, in the, the time that I've been at Western, I've directed the professional writing program, the literature program. I've served as department head in English. I've been associate dean of the graduate school. And for a year, I was a provost fellow, kind of an interim, interim associate provost um, in charge of, of faculty at the university. Um, and I've worked over the years uh, extensively on the reaccreditation reports um, for Western's uh, for WCU's accreditation. Nice. You've got a, a lot under your belt then. <laughs> I've, I've, I've been here a while and I've done a lot of stuff. Yeah. Are you looking to um, tackle head of the rhetoric and composition next? <laughs> no. no? Okay. No, I, I, I <clears throat> for the most part, enjoyed my administrative work, uh, but I did that for many, many years here. And I'm really happy to be back in the classroom and I, I want to just focus on teaching and research for a while. Nice. All right, um, let's get into some student submitted questions then. Okay. Um, so we'll start easy and what, well, maybe it's easy. <laughs> what is your favorite thing about teaching? Um, I would say probably the students. Um, I, I really enjoy and feed off of seeing students succeed. And uh, I really enjoy sharing with them the literature that, that means so much to me. Um, so it's, it's less about, um, you know, feeding students information about medieval literature than it is seeing students grow as professionals and as thinkers. Nice. Um, so then, I guess this, this might be more difficult. But in terms, I guess, of feeding students medieval literature, someone <laughs> asked, um, what is your favorite piece of Brit lit or British literature? Well, that's, you know, that's a horrible question <laughs> as an English professor, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because it's, it's virtually impossible to, to answer. It sort of depends on your criteria for, you know, favorite, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think I think I have favorites for different things. Um, Chaucer's Troilus and Crusader might be my favorite love story. Um, it's it's poignant, it's real, um, but that that kind of realness of human emotion is balanced by this um, uh, genre of the romance and its its kind of historical context. It's it's complicated. Um, in terms of stories that are that are sad or elegiac um, or address the psychology of loss. Um, maybe the Book of the Duchess, which is another uh, work by Chaucer that I, I, I love dearly. Um, but I'm also a big fan of the Lord of the Rings, um, you know, British literature, right? Mm -hmm. uh, given its, its kind of epic grandeur and its focus well, it's, it's balancing of that epic grandeur with an interest in personal relationships and personal friendships. Um, and, you know, I work a great deal on Gower and Gower's Confessio Amantis, and I would say that's my favorite in terms of intellectual curiosity for now, right? So mm -hmm. what I've been working on for years and what I'm working on now. Nice. Um, and I kind of want to meld the two of those together. So with your favorite thing about teaching and your favorite piece of Brit Lit, what's your favorite piece of Brit Lit to teach? Oh, to teach? Yeah. Um, I love teaching the Miller's Tale. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good it, one. Because it's, it's funny, it's smart, 
it's um, it's complicated in, in, in so many ways. It allows us to discuss issues of class and gender and genre and historical context. Um, so, so that's certainly one that I, I really enjoy teaching. Mm -hmm. um, I love teaching Chaucer's Wife of Bath's Tale uh, for similar kinds of reasons, and especially the Wife of Bath's Tale in context of the other loathly lady tales. So Chaucer probably took his version of the story from Gower. So I love teaching Gower's version alongside Chaucer's version, alongside some other versions um, as mm. well. Nice. And that kind of leads to another student question. And I know that you study both, but and you've talked about uh, John Gower and Chaucer in your answers so far. But uh, someone asked, what is the appeal of researching the work of John Gower instead of someone more well known from the time periods like Geoffrey Chaucer? Well, you know, I, I do research and write on Chaucer as well, and I've published on Chaucer and Marjorie Kemp and, and other medieval writers. Um, and I'm currently researching an essay that is devoted to the Knight's Tale, Chaucer's Knight's Tale. Um, but it's true that most of my publication history over the last, you know, 15, 20 years um, and scholarly work has been on Gower. And to some extent, the, the quick answer to that is Gower has provided me opportunities that I seized when I could. Um, so there is, there is less scholarship on Gower and there's still much to be done. Um, early on in my career, I was befriended by uh, Gower scholars across the country, across the world. And they offered me publication opportunities that were important for when I was working towards tenure mm -hmm. um, and promotion. And while I'm interested in, in just about all medieval literature and could work on other things if, if I wanted, um, I've now built up this expertise in Gower and uh, it allows me to say and do things I couldn't when I'm just starting out or when anyone is just starting out focusing on a field. Um, so I think if, if you have intellectual curiosity, it matters less what work it is that you study. Um, as a, instead, it matters more that you are engaged with that work and invested in that work and, and interested in that work. Mm -hmm. Nice. So he's kind of got a, a piece of your heart then. Yeah, I mean, it's, I would not say that, that Gower is a better or worse poet than Chaucer, or Langland, or the Pearl Poet, or anything like that. Mm -hmm. They do different things, right? And um, I probably don't have as much fun reading Gower as I do Chaucer, mm -hmm. but I... I certainly get a lot of intellectual stimulation and um, ideas from reading uh, Gower. Yeah, nice. Um, so then that leads to the next question. Um, and you might have already touched on some of this already, but um, why do you love what you study so much? Uh, well, why do we love anything or anyone, right? Touché. That's a question that many of us spend our whole lives exploring. Mm -hmm. um, I would say in part because it is complicated and interesting um, and appeals to my intellectual curiosity. Um, I find particularly in medieval literature uh, a certain kind of joy and, and pleasure and happiness. Um, as you're probably well aware, much of the quote unquote great literature of the past is really depressing, right? I mean, it's, it's, yeah. just, it's just, you know, sad and horrible and tragic. Um, and and while, while, you know, literature from other periods certainly can be humorous, I, I just don't see the kind of joy of life um, 
that I see in, in medieval literature. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see this kind of hope or humor uh, that's juxtaposed with the sadness and the loss and indignation at, at the foibles of the world. Um, you know, I think I love it because it shows us what humanity is or what it could be or what it should be um, because it, it, it speaks to us and it, it can make us better people. It could make, it, I think it has made me a better person. Mm -hmm. Nice. I like that. Um, and I could ask so many more questions, <laughs> but ask oh. as many questions as you want. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, I didn't send you this one beforehand, but it's uh, talking to you now has made me think to to ask it because I know that you've been working on a translation with your wife, correct? Yes. Um, Dr. Carter. Yes. Um, would you mind telling me and anyone who watches a little about that? Sure. Um, uh, the hard part is going to be telling you a little about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Gower wrote three long works, one in French, one in Latin, and one in English, Middle mm -hmm. English. And because of that, in many ways, he represents the late medieval English period uh, better than Chaucer because we only have works from Chaucer in English. And England and London in particular was a trilingual culture, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Latin was the language of, the, of learning. French was the language of, of aristocracy and art, the, the kind of continental lingua franca. Um, and English was the vernacular. So his long English work is the Confessio Amantis, which is the confession of a lover. Mm -hmm. And it is, um, it is a very long work. It is 33,000 lines long. It, is, uh, it has a prologue and eight books. And it is basically a frame tale <clears throat> where a lover goes out in the woods and is complaining that his love doesn't love him. He meets Venus, and Venus is going to try to cure him of his lovesickness. And the way that she does this is by sending the lover, his name is Amans, her priest, whose name is Genius. And Genius proceeds to tell dozens and dozens and dozens of stories, mostly drawn from, <clears throat> from the Bible, from classical mythology, from history, right? Um, and each tale that is told is meant to serve as an example, the, the medieval term is exemplum, a story that teaches a moral lesson. And Genius, the priest, tells a story to uh, Amans, the lover, and says, this is what the story teaches you or should teach you about how to love or how not to love. And then asks the lover, are you guilty of this sin? because each, each book is devoted to a different one of the seven deadly sins. And uh, one of the books, so there's eight books, mm -hmm. seven books to the seven deadly sins. And one of the books, book seven, is devoted to the education of kings. Uh, Gower and many other medieval authors were very interested in what makes a good king. And Genius tells a bunch of stories on that, that, that teach us what a good ruler or leader should do. So that's the context for um, the, the Confessio Montes. That work has never been translated in its entirety into modern English, mm -hmm. probably because it is so long. Um, it is written in iambic tetrameter. So it has an eight beat line as opposed to Chaucer's 10 beat iambic pentameter line. It's, it's almost entirely in rhymed couplets. So it is a formal poem, uh, rhymed iambic tetrameter. And we are translating it, uh, we're, we're, we're performing a, a literal translation. We want this to be an aid for students to use mm -hmm. so that if they want to read Gower without reading the Middle English, they can read this. If they want to try Gower's Middle English, they could use this as a crib or, or as a help, right, for, for them reading Middle English. So we're, we're going for a very literal line-by-line -line translation but we are also, and actually we've just started the revision of the, the translation. We finished a first draft of it. And we're, we're starting the revision where we are trying to retain the octosyllabic line. So we're hoping to make every line eight syllables. And, and even if possible, if it, doesn't, if it doesn't detract from meaning or clarity, 
mm -hmm. uh, we'll keep it in the iambic. So it'll be a bum 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 bum. We're not going to have the rhymes, but um, we think that 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 formal element is important for students or readers generally to understand that Chaucer's original was a formal poem. Nice. That's really cool. And I Thank bet you. it took a long time. The first draft took us a couple of years. We're hoping wow. this, the, the read through will go a little bit quicker. Mm. Uh, so, you know, we're not sure exactly when we'll have a manuscript finished, but maybe a year ish or so. Nice. We'll have to keep a lookout for that then. All right. So I think we will move away from um, Middle English. Um, Although I know that you could probably talk forever about it. I could talk for a long time about yeah. it. That's, that's a problem. <laughs> yeah. Or is it? <laughs> All right. Uh, so I think to start wrapping up, um, what advice do you have for students? Um, well, I think <laughs> my, my first response would be, undergraduate or graduate, <laughs> because okay. I, I think there's different advice I would give to students at different levels of their, of their career, right? Mm -hmm. um, advice that I would give to students regardless of, of their level and their kind of position in their, their academic curricula is to, um, and I know this is really difficult, to, to try to worry less about grades and jobs and what you're going to do when you graduate. I, I don't say don't think about thing, those things at all, right? Mm. But to think less about those things and more about pursuing those things that interest you, those things that you have a passion for. Certainly keep an eye on the market, keep an eye on where there are jobs and the things that you can do to, to have a career. But if you can find a career path doing the kind of things that, that speak to you, um, you are gonna be happier in your life and you're going to do better at those things. Um, you've, you've probably heard me say a couple of times that phrase intellectual curiosity. Mm -hmm. Find ways to feed your intellectual curiosity in whatever it is you do. Uh, when I was first hired here at, at WCU, I was hired primarily to teach business writing. And I have a lot of friends uh, and colleagues who, who said, oh, you know, isn't that, you know, isn't that boring? You're just doing that because you have to, because that's where, where the job was. I'm like, no, you know, if you have intellectual curiosity, I found professional writing and business and technical writing really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, find the joy and intellectual curiosity in whatever you're doing. That's the main piece of advice I would give. Nice. And do you have specific advice for undergraduate and graduate students? Well, um, I think for, for undergraduate students, it's, it's about keeping their minds open to possibilities. Um, you probably are aware there's, there's a lot of research out there that says that most people end up getting jobs that don't directly relate to their, uh, their degree. Right. Certainly if you get a nursing degree, you become a nurse, right? But if you if you get a degree in history, few people who get a degree in history become a historian. They do all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Same thing with English, same thing with philosophy, you know, most of the liberal arts, even many of the sciences. And there are so many jobs and careers out there that you have no idea they're out there, right? You you don't even know that they exist, mm -hmm. much less thinking about, oh, this is the degree I need to get in order to, to get that kind of job. Mm. Um, I've had students who've gone on to, you know, work in the medical profession and they were, they were literature majors, right? I've had them go into, um, uh, one went to work for Gore, riding a stationary bike and trying out their, um, uh, their new clothing, right? To write reports for that clothing. I had a, a, a graduate student, a uh, new graduate student who went on to run a funeral home. Um, there's, you know, there's all kinds of things out there that you can do. So for undergraduates, it, it really is about go into the major that speaks to you the most and, and worry less about 
what specific career you're going to go into because you can always parlay that that degree into a job in a thousand different different fields and careers that you don't even you aren't even aware of yet um, for graduate students i think it's a little different because theoretically at this point you are you've taken a few steps down a career path mm -hmm. right so uh, especially at the master's level uh, the master's degree is an eminently marketable degree, uh, but it is marketable in a, in a kind of a more focused way, right? So there are expectations employers and careers have for somebody who has a master's degree in English. And I still think at the graduate level, you should focus on those things that, that, that call to you, that speak to you and that you have a passion for. But also keep in mind that as a master's student, that's a professional degree and you are undergoing professionalization. So it isn't just about taking classes and doing the work. It's about starting to think of yourself less as a student and more as a colleague, more as a professional. Nice, thank you for that. Um, it's nice to hear just for me even. <laughs> Uh, all right. So is there anything else that you would like to share um, for your time in the spotlight? Um, it depends. What are you up for? <laughs> Absolutely anything. So if I, have, if I have a couple of minutes, um, I always like to share something in particular. Okay. I'd like to read some Middle English. Go for it. Can I do that? You right. sure can. Yeah. So... Um, uh, just a, a brief passage from Gower. He, he wrote a number of very biting social commentaries before turning to the, the Confessio Montes, which has its share of satire as well. Um, but I want to read the opening <clears throat> of the Confessio, where he talks about what he's going to focus on um, in this work and what he thinks is the most important thing for all of us to focus on, and that is love. And love in a, in a broad sense, right? Not just romantic love, but love mm -hmm. for each other, love for, for humanity, um, for, for, for him, it's love for God, right? It's, it's all of those aspects that, that, that come together. And what he sees as the biggest problem in the world, which is we all love either too much or too little. If we love too much, we, we are greedy right? We, um, we desire things in inappropriate ways. Mm -hmm. And if we love too little, we lack compassion and, and humility and, and things of that nature. So this is, this is the passage where he sort of sets out <clears throat> that, that concept that will inform the rest of the Confessio Montes. He says, or he writes, he may not stretch up to the heaven in hand, ne set in all an ave in this world, which ever is in balance. It stant not in me sufficience, so great things to compass. But he mot let it overpass, and traiten upon other things. For the the steel of me readings, fro this die forth, he think a change, and spake of thing that is not so strange, which every kind hath upon hand, and whereupon the world must stand, and hath done sith in it began, and shall will there is any mana, and that is love of which he mean to trait, as after shall be seen, in which there can no man him rule, for love is law, is out of rule that of to much or of to little, well knee is every man to wit. And I, I love that, that one line that he has in there, um, love's law is out of rule. Um, love is unruly, love cannot be measured. Um, love is, is uncontrollable um, and Gower, who is involved with legal issues throughout his life, he uses legal language a lot. Uh, it also relates to, you know, kind of feudal lordship and how love should be our, our lord in that 
kind of feudal sense as well. Um, so I just find it a, a lovely passage. Yeah, that is nice. Um, sort it can be relevant to today too, for sure. I, I will refrain from political commentary, All right. <laughs> um, but Gower would not. Um, Gower, Gower would very much say, and so would Chaucer, that the greatest, um, the greatest attribute for a ruler is pity, mm -hmm. is mercy, is kindness. Um, Chaucer has a great line that he repeats in a number of works, pity reneth son and gentle herta. Pity runs quickly in a gentle heart. And by gentle there, he means gentility. He means a noble mm -hmm. heart. Um, so, so for both Chaucer and Gower and many other medieval writers, political writers, um, they were very much interested in rulers who showed pity, who showed mercy, who showed humility, um, and, and that might not be a bad thing to have in a leader. Yeah. Nice. Well, I really enjoyed talking to you today. Well, I enjoyed being able to talk about about. This. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so glad. <laughs> well, thank you again. And congratulations on being the faculty spotlight. Thank you.